Well, I invite you to take God's Word and turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 1. Today we shall look at verses 12 and 13. If you're visiting with us today, we are engaged in a verse-by-verse study of the Gospel of Mark, and we find ourselves early in this Gospel account, and we find ourselves in one of the most important and one of the most strategic episodes and instances in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. The title of the message today is Confrontation in the Wilderness. Mark chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Immediately, the Spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts. And the angels were ministering to him. The Bible teaches the Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. This was at the very heart of his reason for coming into the world. It was to wield a death blow to the evil kingdom of Satan, and through his death and his sacrifice, to release its sin-bound captives. At the very dawn of creation, Satan first tempted Eve into sinning against God. And in response, God cursed the serpent, saying, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you will bruise him on the heel." This curse in Genesis 3.15 is prophetic of the age-long struggle that will exist between Satan and Christ and between unbelievers and all true believers who are in the Lord. In this prophecy at the very dawn of the Bible, in fact, it's called the Proto-Euangelion, the first mention of the Gospel in the Bible. It is said by God, that Satan will bruise the heel of Christ, which pictures the blow at the cross that Christ would receive, and yet it would not be a fatal blow, and he would recover and be raised from the dead. Yet at the same time, Christ in his coming will utterly crush the head of the devil at the cross and wield a deadly blow from which the devil would not recover. And as Jesus approached the cross, Jesus said, Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. It is with this conflict in the air, and with this confrontation looming out in the wilderness we see the strategic importance of this temptation of Christ in the wilderness. At the very beginning of our Lord's confrontation, there was this one-on-one conflict between Satan and the Lord, and it was but a precursor of what would occur three years later upon Calvary's cross. It is the first of a series of conflicts that will climax at Golgotha. Here in this temptation of Christ by Satan is a direct confrontation between heaven and hell, holiness and sin, good and evil, and at stake. And what is on the table is who will be the ruler of this world and who will rule the souls of men. Mark has two primary purposes in presenting this temptation of Christ in the wilderness, which is unique to Mark's presentation of the gospel. First, Mark has placed this temptation here, and by the way, it is the shortest of the three synoptic gospels. Mark places it here, understand this, to demonstrate the indomitable resiliency of the true servant of the Lord, Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ is unwavering in His saving mission here upon the earth. 
And Jesus Christ will not be deterred to seek and to save that which is lost. He will not be defeated by even the other great ruler and dominion in the universe, Satan himself. And so Christ here in the wilderness, we are presented His first direct battle with the great enemy of our souls, Satan, and He has given evidence of His unwavering supreme will and the efficacy of His work to save His people from their sins. What we see here is the glorious triumph of Jesus Christ that belongs to all who put their faith and trust in Him. And that leads to the second purpose of why this is placed here. Early in Mark's Gospel, it is not in John's Gospel. It is to reveal to us that all who put their trust in Christ will share in His victory over sin, over Satan, and over hell itself. Every one of us here today is either a child of God or a child of the devil, and there are no other families in the universe. Every one of us here today is either a child of God, and that is those who are born again by the Spirit of God from above, or a child of the devil. And everyone who is a child of the devil will share in this same fate. All unbelievers share with Satan this fate of being defeated and doomed and even damned. But on the other hand, all who put their faith and their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and find themselves in the loins of Christ and in Christ will share in this victory in their lives. So choose well which side you stand upon. There are only two sides, Christ and Satan. And there are only two outcomes, victory and defeat. And Christ's victory here is a victory for all who will put their faith and their trust in Him. Now, as we look at verses 12 and 13 today, Admittedly, it is but two verses in Mark's Gospel. Matthew and Luke require 11 and 12 verses to expound this. I nevertheless see five essential truths that I want to draw to your attention from this text of Scripture. I want you to note the timing at the very beginning of verse 12 immediately. I want you to notice the thrust. The Spirit impelled him. That's the thrust to go out into the wilderness. He is literally hurled into this confrontation by the Holy Spirit of God. And then notice third, the terrain. In verse 13, he was in the wilderness. At the end of verse 12, he went out into the wilderness. That is the terrain. And then fourth, the temptation We read in verse 13 that he was being tempted, present tense, throughout the entirety of the 40 days and 40 nights, not merely three temptations, but 40 days of temptation. We will look at this. And then finally, the triumph. At the end of verse 13, we simply read the angels were ministering to him. Once Satan went out, the angels came in and ministered to him in this post-victory time. I want you to note first the timing, and this is so important because this will affect some of the timing in your life as well. How God worked in the life of His own Son will bear some resemblance to how God works in the timing of your life as well. Notice how verse 12 begins, immediately you know that this is one of the primary words in Mark's Gospel. Some 34, 35 times this word immediately is found. And here it speaks to the timing of the temptation account. We will look at the what of the temptation in a moment, but the when is also very important. It was immediately after verses 9 through 11. It was immediately after Jesus had been baptized in the Jordan River. It was immediately after the Holy Spirit descended upon Him 
in verse 10 to empower him for his messianic ministry. It was immediately after the heavens opened up and in verse 11, the voice of God said, This is my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. It was immediately after the windows of heaven had been opened to bless him that the devil opened the gates of hell to blast him. It was immediately after he was anointed by the Spirit that he was attacked by Satan. It was immediately after Jesus heard the voice of God from heaven that he heard the voice of the devil in the wilderness. Immediately, Jesus went from the dove to the devil. Immediately, Jesus went from the Father's smile to the devil's strike. The reason I draw your attention to this is because this is so much like how God operates in our lives as well. We don't necessarily go from victory unto victory without there being challenges in between. And after our highest moments of greatest victory in the Christian life, so often God orchestrates our greatest tests and our greatest trials. And this is so representative of our daily living to see this here. The mountaintop experience is so often followed by the low valley of the wilderness. So let us beware. It is when we step forward to serve God. It is when we are filled with the Spirit. It is when we most have the Father's approval that it is when we can most expect to meet the devil head on. Drawing closer to God can be an occupational hazard. Drawing closer to God does not remove temptation. It actually at times invites all the more. And it is when we step forward to serve God that we are most vulnerable to become targets for Satan. This is the timing. And you and I can expect much the same. Have you recently taken on a new ministry? Have you recently been promoted to the front lines in some way and for God to set an open door before you? Have you recently drawn close to the Lord and your Bible study has become more precious than it has been in quite some time? Then beware, because Satan roars about as a prowling lion, seeking someone to devour. Let us not be naive that we are the most vulnerable for defeat after our greatest victories. And the devil knows this. And after he, the Lord has come out of the river Jordan is precisely when he meets the devil head on. And so it will be so many times in our own lives. But listen, don't let that intimidate you. Because greater is He who is in you than he who is in the world. And as we are about to see, it was the sovereign will of God to send the Son of Man into the wilderness, onto Satan's turf, to take the battle to the devil. And I want you to note now second with me, the thrust, the aggressive thrust. As we continue to read in verse 12, immediately... The Spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness. We need to understand that this was the perfect will of God for the Son of Man. And this was the perfect timing for this divine appointment, this rendezvous in the wilderness. Jesus is personally and directly impelled by the Holy Spirit into this conflict. And there will be times as we are filled with the Spirit and walk with the Lord when the Spirit of God will hurl us into the conflict as well to be mightily used by God. Note this word impelled. Matthew and Luke, in their accounts of this, use much weaker words. 
Now, they use the word merely led. But Mark is far more graphic and I think uh, opens up so much more to our understanding. He was impelled to go out into the wilderness. I want to talk just for a moment about this word impelled. I want us to understand this. Ekbalo is the Greek word. It means literally to, to, to throw something into another matter. To, to force out, to cast out. In fact, this very word is used two more times in this chapter of exorcisms that Christ performed when He cast out demons out of people. This is the very same word. It's the same word that's used later in Mark chapter 11 when Jesus went into the temple and single-handedly cast out the money changers. It was powerful. It was gripping. It was overpowering as Jesus went into the temple. And the sheer force of His convictions and the force of His person cleaned house. Ekbalo. It's the very same word that's used here. Jesus was not gingerly led into the wilderness. Jesus was literally forced by the Spirit of God, not as if against His will, but with a sense of urgency, with a sense of necessity. It was the Spirit of God who impelled Him out into this wilderness. And so it was God Himself, by the powerful working of the Holy Spirit, who thrust His Son out to this conflict. And this was no chance encounter with Satan. This was a divine appointment that was orchestrated by God and strategized by the Spirit of God as Jesus Christ took the attack to the devil, and it was so symbolic that he had come into this world to utterly destroy and cast down the works of the devil. And so it is with us. There are times in the life of every spirit-filled believer within the perfect will of God when we too are impelled by the Spirit into confrontation with satanic forces. Is not every missionary who is sent to the mission field in one way or another thrust to the front lines of the attack? Is not every man who enters into the ministry and every man who steps into leadership in the church in one way or another thrust into this conflict in an even more dramatic and graphic way. As we walk in the Spirit and as we are led by the Spirit, we too are thrust into the devil's warfare. And as we are a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ at school with unsaved friends, out in the marketplace with those who do not know Christ, and at times even with family and those who are acquaintances as we hold the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ, we too are cast into the arena of conflict and we are there by God's design and we are there by God's initiative. God forbid that we ever whine or whimper about this because we are there at God's bidding. And so this is if you will note with me the thrust and how powerful and dramatic was this thrust. May we know this power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. There are times that I have known this in my life and I trust every time I step into this pulpit the hand of the Lord would be upon me and every moment of every day as I live my Christian life that I would walk in the Spirit and not according to the flesh. And there will be this kind of experience of being led and even thrust forward into the world. Third, I want you to note with me the terrain. We've seen the timing immediately. And we've seen the thrust, how the Spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness. Third, the terrain. We see that in, at the end of verse 12 into the wilderness, and we see it at the beginning of verse 13, He was in the wilderness. 
The actual place in the wilderness is unknown to us, but it was probably somewhere not far from the Jordan River where he had been baptized in verse 9. We do know from this word wilderness that it was a barren and isolated place, a very rough terrain. The geographical terrain of the Judean wilderness was hot, it was barren, it was an, a desolate region that extended west from the Jordan River and the Dead Sea almost all the way to Jerusalem. And to this day, you can be on a, a tour bus and go through these winding roads and at times you feel like you're on the surface of the moon. I mean, there is, there is no sign of life anywhere even to this day. It is just filled with coarse sand and crumbling limestone and contorted strata jagged ridges and stark rocks. It is, it is lifeless and it has the appearance of even being a cursed place. It was on this rugged turf under the worst of conditions that Jesus was tempted by Satan. Nowhere in Palestine could Jesus have been more isolated or more vulnerable than in this wilderness. And to heighten our appreciation of how desolate this was, in verse 13, Mark adds what Matthew and Luke do not add. He adds in verse 13, and he was with the wild beast, which almost seems to be a strange addition, but what Mark is wanting to underscore for us is that Jesus was far removed from human habitation. He was in a place where only the beasts roamed and prowled, which would add to the terror for the Lord Jesus Christ. In this region, there abounded boars and jackals and wolves, foxes, leopards, hyenas, and even lions. And so all of this, as Christ is in the wilderness, He is in a place that is filled with danger. He is removed from the watching eyes of His disciples, whom He would call shortly. It is dangerous. It is devil-filled. And what a contrast is this terrain from the first temptation. The first Adam was tempted in a beautiful wilderness, in a beautiful garden. Jesus in this dangerous desert. Now listen to this. The first Adam failed in paradise. The second Adam triumphed in a wilderness. What is the message? The first Adam failed while feasting. The second Adam triumphed while fasting. The first Adam failed while he had everything at his fingertips and he was living in paradise, the Garden of Eden. The second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, triumphed when he had nothing in the most desolate, difficult set of circumstances in which he could find himself. What is the lesson? We can never blame our environment for our moral failures. Some people say, well, if you'd only known the home that I grew up in. Well, let me tell you something. You need to let go of that excuse and grow up. And you need to look to the Lord Jesus Christ who so heroically in the desert, fasting 40 days and 40 nights, and literally the devil himself, one-on-one conflict in his face, in his kitchen, assaulting him from every angle and at every side, trying to take him down and defeat him. I can assure you, you've never faced that. Not like this. And yet the Lord Jesus Christ, as we shall see in just a moment, He overcame the devil. And He remained steadfast 
And He won the victory, and that victory is available for everyone who puts their faith and their trust in Him. Do you work in a jungle? Do you go to school in a desert? Do you live in a wilderness? No matter how adverse your environment may may be, you may live victorious and you may overcome Satan and you may overcome the works of darkness as you avail yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ and put on the full armor of God. Hear this. There is no terrain upon this earth in which you cannot live victoriously in Jesus Christ. There is not one square inch of this planet in which you cannot, with your eyes on the Lord and your faith and trust in Him, win the battle. This is put here to show us at the very beginning of our Lord's ministry that He is the victorious servant of the Lord who can overcome everything the devil wants to throw at him and walk out of that desert victorious. And so can you and I as we put our faith and our hope and our trust in the Lord. Some of you live with the devil. Some of you live with an unsaved spouse. Some of you have the devil for a father-in-law or a mother-in-law. You can live victorious in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want you to note third with me, the temptation. Note with me in verse 13 the temptation itself. And he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. In Matthew's account and Luke's account, we are given the explanation of what those three temptations were at the end of the time. And in just a moment, we will be turning to Matthew's account. But before we go there, I want to make some initial observations with you here in Mark's Gospel. In verse 13 it says he was in the wilderness 40 days. 40 days is found in different places of Scripture and has often been, or even 40 years, as a period of testing, a a designated parentheses in time in which a test would take place. For example, Israel was 40 years in the wilderness going in circles And Moses spent 40 days on Mount Sinai. Elijah spent 40 days traveling to the sacred mountain. And Jesus spent 40 days instructing His disciples before His ascension from the Mount of Olives. He was in the wilderness 40 days. And that signals our reading that this would be a testing time. Notice, being tempted by Satan. Mark obviously believed in a real personal devil. By Satan. Satan is mentioned by seven Old Testament writers and by every New Testament writer. He is the supernatural ruler of a demonic kingdom who opposes God's work and will in the world. He is head of the kingdom of evil. He is a real fallen angel who can only be in one place at one time and he is here now ready to seduce and subdue the soul of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice, he is being tempted. Being tempted by Satan. The verb tense here is in the present tense, which would indicate that Jesus was being repeatedly and continually tempted for the entirety of the 40 days. Not merely three snowballs thrown at Him at the end of this time. But for the entirety of this period, He was being tempted 
by Satan. What is temptation? It is a solicitation to sin. It is an enticement to evil. It is an allurement into iniquity. Is it a sin to be tempted? No. Jesus was tempted. It says so very plainly. And yet, He was the sinless Son of God. The sin is caving into the temptation and yielding to the temptation. And so this was Satan's strategy to derail the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can be rest assured that Satan will use this very same strategy against all the seed of the woman who are in the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Temptation is the idea of a hunter seeking to lure its prey by offering something that the hunted animal wants. It is a game of deception. It is a game of luring. That is precisely what the devil was about with Satan. I think it would do us all well to turn to Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 4, that we might see spelled out for us what these three temptations were that are recorded at the end of the 40-day period. And I think they are very representative of every temptation that comes our way. In Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 2, we read Matthew's account of the same. And we read, after he had fasted, Forty days and forty nights. Stop right there. Fasting was always in association with prayer. And I think what is taking place here, among other things, as Jesus is beginning His public ministry, He begins with a concentrated season of prayer. He is being impelled by the Spirit into the wilderness to take on the devil, but also to be alone with His Father and to humble himself before the will and the work of God to embrace it and to commit himself in the entirety of his ministry to the Father in prayer. Something that we will learn later in Mark chapter 1 was a regular practice of the Lord Jesus Christ to withdraw in isolation with his Father and to be in prayer. I think that that is what is taking place with the emphasis upon fasting. And it says that he became very hungry. I think no doubt that the the Lord Jesus is in connection with his Father in prayer only invites the devil's attack all the more because of the strategic nature of prayer, how vital prayer is to the success of our ministry. And as Jesus is fasting and no doubt praying, This draws Satan to break this up. And so we read of the first temptation that is recorded in verse 3. And the tempter, that is how Matthew identifies the devil, as simply the tempter. This is such a tool that he uses is that he is identified simply as the tempter. Came and said to him, the devil is a fallen angel who has the capacity of of language and communication and can speak. And so he speaks with an audible voice to the Son of God. If you are the Son of God, stop right there. Out of the Greek, literally, since you are the Son of God. There there is not a debate going on in the wilderness. The devil knows exactly who the Lord Jesus Christ is. This is his greatest dread. So he says, since you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Now we need to understand that this temptation is far more than Jesus satisfying his gnawing hunger. There's far more on the table than Jesus simply satisfying his craving. This temptation is a snowball that has a rock in it. This temptation 
is intended to cause Christ to doubt the Father's care and protection. In other words, to doubt the goodness of God in His life. And let me tell you, that is going to be one of His primary temptations with you. No matter what you have, no matter how much has been afforded to you, the devil will be always trying to lure you away to what you don't have and causing you to think, you know, God is holding out on me when in fact He has opened the windows of heaven and has poured out His blessing upon you. And by the way, that is precisely what He did with Eve when He first slithered onto the pages of Scripture when He said, Has God said you shall not eat from this particular tree? Think about this. Eve lived in paradise. She had the whole world to herself. She lived in a perfect world. It won't be until we're in the millennial kingdom can we even comprehend how God first created this world to be. She had everything in a perfect world and there was one thing she could not have and that was the goodness of God to protect her from eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was like a parent telling a child, do not put your hand on a hot skillet. That's not bad. That's good. Instruction. Do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because it will corrupt your mind. That's what's going on in this first temptation. Let me spell it out this way. So you're the Son of God. What are you doing out here? Is this any way for God to treat His Son? He is your Father, is that right? You're not eating. You're looking a little thin. I thought God loved you. I thought God cared for you. I thought God would provide for you. What are you doing out here in this awful place not eating? You know what you need to do? You just need to snap your fingers. You just need to say to these stones, bread. You need to provide for yourself. You need to take care of yourself. You could do better than this. I think God means well. I think He intends well for you. But this just isn't happening for your life the way it ought to be happening. And with that, trying to plant seeds of discontent into the heart and the soul of the Son of God. And let me tell you, this was a real temptation. So if you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Use your own divine powers to supply what the Father has not for you. This was a deadly temptation. And I want you to know it is the very same temptation that God will, I mean, that the devil will throw at every one of us. To be content, discontent with your job, to be discontent with your family, to be discontent with your ministry, to be discontent with your church, to be discontent with whatever. And to cause you to take matters into your own hands and supply for yourself. And really what's under this is the devil will do anything to break up this prayer fast. So notice verse 4, But he answered the Lord Jesus Christ, listen, that was no more in the air, that deadly temptation. This was no time to, well, let's have prayer about this. You need to fight fire with fire and not let those deadly seeds percolate in the heart And immediately he answered and said, It is written. There is no greater instrument to be used in spiritual warfare 
than the Word of God in the hand of a Spirit-filled believer. And so Jesus said, it is written. This is the sufficiency of Scripture. To say the devil made me do it is caving in to a lie. It is written. And now Jesus, think about how well he knows the Word of God. He doesn't have a computer out in the desert and do a topical word study. He doesn't have a MacArthur study Bible, even. He has so saturated himself with the Word of God, and sometimes, you ought to do this, I've done it, read the Gospel of Luke and Mark every time Jesus quotes Scripture. It will overwhelm you. In quoting Deuteronomy 8, Jesus said, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And in saying this, Jesus was saying, Man is better off to obey God and depend upon God and wait for His provision than to pursue satisfaction on my own schedule in my own way. By this, Jesus is doing more than just quoting the verse. Listen, the next temptation, the devil is going to be quoting verses to him. There is nothing in just quoting the verse. By saying this, Jesus is believing the verse, trusting the verse, embracing the verse, living the verse. And he says, in essence, I will obey God's Word and I will serve God's interests, not my own. This was the first temptation. It was to doubt the goodness of God, and I want you to know He still calls that play time after time after time in our lives. There then comes a second temptation in verse 5. Notice the first word, then. You'll note that Luke's account of these temptations is different from Matthew's account, meaning different order. Matthew gives them in the chronological order in which they unfolded, hence the word then in verse 5. Luke gives the theological unfolding of them. And so this is the order in which they actually came in Matthew's gospel. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. How they got up there, we do not know. But there in Jerusalem, the devil takes Jesus to the house of God. How amazing it is that the great temptation takes place in the house of God. Not in a den of ill repute, not in the harlot's den, not in some, some uh, swamp of iniquity, The great temptation happens where the place the Word of God is taught and preached and takes Him to the the pinnacle of the temple, the holy city, Jerusalem, and said to Him again, if you're the Son of God, since you're the Son of God, throw yourself down. Jump! This is going to be wonderful for your ministry. This will be so sensational. The crowds will be up. Jump. Do a double half gainer. And the Lord will send angels from heaven and they'll swoop down. You can go on television with this. You can be having crusades with this. And the people will eat this up. And there will be a a frenzy for your ministry. Think about all the people that will believe on you if you'll just go to the temple and jump. Now watch this at the end of verse 6. For it is written. And it's like, all right, you want to play this with the Bible? Then let me quote Bible to you. And the devil quotes Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12, and it speaks to how well the devil knows the Bible. Let me tell you, he's smarter than any brain in this building today. 
He is a supernatural genius of sinister order that he could turn people's thinking inside out and outside in if they do not have the Holy Spirit living within them. You want to know how people get sucked into cults? How they become sucked into every kind of lie? Because the devil is a supernatural genius. So he quotes the verse. He will command His angels concerning you. Put God to the test. You say you trust God. You're not going to turn these stones into bread. You say you're going to trust God. Let's see you trust God. Jump. And He will send His angels concerning you to catch you and bear you up. Next verse, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Of course, the devil is misusing these verses and subtly twisting them and ripping them out of their context. I know a lot of churches that would like go to a conference on this. Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And now Jesus quoted Scripture, but He is choosing to obey this Scripture which says we should not put God to the test like this. God will not be forced to jump when we snap our fingers in order that He might take care of us because of our foolishness. God will not be forced to bail us out when we arrogantly do our own thing. By quoting this verse, Jesus is saying, I will not force my will upon the will of God. I will not test God as if I am above God, passing out the exam to God and test God. I will not act as if God must take my tests. And what the temptation here is from Satan is to force God's will in your life to fit your agenda. There's a third temptation. In verse 8, Again, and we see the chronological sequencing here, again. And again, this takes place at the end of the 40 days and 40 nights. So this is the, the, the climactic three fastballs that the devil is serving up. The devil took him to a very high mountain. It was a, a mountain so high he is able to see a long distance, the Middle East, Jerusalem, Judea, this part of the world is a land of extraordinary contrast in which you go from the desert floor to towering, jutting mountains. All in a very small period of time, you go from lush green valleys to barren brown desert and from flatlands and river sides all the way to these Very, very tall mountains. Some people call mountains that are really nothing more than a little bump on the horizon. These really are high, very high mountains. And in so doing, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. There there is a miracle in this. In some sense, that the devil is able to parade the kingdoms of the world before the watching eyes of Christ, the imperial might and splendor of Rome and Egypt and all of the other world empires are dangled out before the watching eyes of Christ as if to say they're yours for the taking. I want you to know Satan still does this with politicians. He still does this with businessmen. He still does this with preachers. 
He still does this with athletes. He still does this with musicians. To dangle the world in front at a price. Remember, He's the ruler of this world, the God of this age. And Jesus will not dispute His right to make this offer. And I want you to know, at the end of this age, the devil will find someone to take him up on this offer. He is the man of sin known as the Antichrist. And if you'll just worship me, I will give you the world. And so this is a real and legitimate temptation. And so Jesus is taken up to this mountain in this area from which He has a 360 view and can look Transjordan can look to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west. And the devil has shown him the kingdoms of the world and offered them to him on a silver platter. And he, the devil, said to him, the Son of God, all these things I will give you. And he meant it. And with that, he shoves all the chips on the table over in front of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything. Yours. And here's the price. Just change your priorities a little. I just need you to alter your priorities. Just once. No one's out here and no one will see. No one's looking. No one will know about this. Just once. If you fall down, and with this we can see the sinister smile of Satan and worship me. Just once, bow your knee. Just once. Just fall down and acknowledge me. And let me remind you that the Father has promised the kingdoms of the world to Christ already and promised them to Him So what is so subtle about this is Satan is offering the will of God just the devil's way. Because there is coming a day when the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His God and He shall reign forever and ever. And from before the foundation of the world, the Father has said to the Son, Psalm 2, verse 7, Ask of me and I will give you the nations of the world. And it will be the inheritance of the Son to receive from the Father everything that the Son has created. It's all coming to the Son. But there is a price for the Son. And the price is obedience to the will of God. And that obedience would take Him to a cross there where He would be lifted up to die for sinners upon the cross. And so what Satan is offering here is, I will give you the same, just no pain. You don't have to go through the commitment. You don't have to go through the subjugation. You don't have to go through the death and the humiliation. After all, aren't you the Son of God? Don't you get to ride first class? Just worship me once no one will see it. And it was an attempt to subvert Christ from the cross because a sinful Savior is no one's Savior. And just one little sin committed by Christ would consign all of us to hell forever. That was what was so lethal And all the fine print is never really explained by the devil, is it? So verse 10, Jesus said to him, Go, Satan! End of discussion! 
there comes a point where you no longer cast pearls before swine. Go! For it is written, and with this, no doubt Jesus emphatically, with His voice, quotes this, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. Key word, only. There can be no dual religion going on here. There can be no compromise of the glory of God. There can be no syncretistic religion here. There can be no worship God, but I'll hang on to Buddha over here. Or worship God and hang on to my, my Islam faith over here. No, the believer must worship and serve God only, exclusively, and that is the rub of the gospel. That there is only one way of salvation. And this word only defines that. You cannot worship God and anyone else. You cannot, listen to this, serve anyone else. All God's children are bondservants who exist to do His bidding. And you and I face these same three temptations. They are categorized in 1 John 2, verse 16, as the lust of the flesh, that is, turn these stones into bread, the lust of the eyes, that is, He showed Him the kingdoms of this world, and the boastful pride of life, which is, stand on the temple in Jerusalem, and get everyone's attention and jump and everyone will clap for you. It is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. And there is no temptation that you and I will ever face, but that does not in one way or another come under these three main categories. It is the temptation of, number one, doubting God's goodness. It is the temptation, number two, of forcing God's will. And the temptation, number three, of minimizing God's lordship over our lives. Fifth and finally, I want you to note the triumph. You know how this ends. Come back, if you would, to Mark 1.13 and... We'll finish this, and we'll finish this on a high note. I want you to note not only the temptation, but the triumph. Because after each of the devil's temptations were firmly resisted, we read this at the end of verse 13. And the angels were ministering to him. Matthew 4.11 is helpful to us, which says, The devil left him, and behold, meaning, look at this, take note of this, angels came and began to minister to him. Comparing Matthew 4.11 with this text, I think we are to assume that after Jesus has resisted the devil and said, Go! Once he left, the angels came in and began to minister to Him. How did they minister to Him? We're not told. But they came and supplied what Jesus needed. Perhaps they provided bodily nourishment in the form of food now that the 40-day fast was complete. Perhaps they provided bodily protection from the wild animals. This is not the millennial kingdom yet. Perhaps they provided spiritual assurance of the Father's presence. Whatever it was, it was real and it was helpful to Christ in His humanity. And as we read the end of this, the fact that the angels are now ministering to Him is intended to show us that He has come through this assault, standing and victorious. And what we are to understand from this is this servant of the Lord, which is Mark's perspective of Christ, 
This servant of the Lord will not be defeated in carrying out the work and the will of God. This servant will prevail. This servant is made of the right stuff. This servant is resolute in his will and in his heart. This servant will not take the easy road. This servant will not cave in to the pressure around him. This servant will remain true to his master, the Father above. This servant is an impeccable Savior who cannot sin. And this servant is worthy of our trust, is worthy of our faith. And no matter what we will ever come against, and no matter what will ever be hurled against us, if we lay hold of this servant Savior, He is greater than whatever we will face. He is greater than the devil. He will carry us through triumphantly. There is the sufficiency of this servant Savior. Did you get that? That's why this is planted right here at the outset of Mark's Gospel. And for the next three years, our Lord will move deliberately to the cross and He will be undeterred as He will set His face like a flint towards Jerusalem. And He will be casting out devils eleven times in this Gospel but He has already proven and shown His sovereignty and supremacy over all the forces of hell. He is effectual and successful in all of His work and in all of His ministry. He will never be defeated. He will never be resisted. He will never be deflected. He will never be altered. This Sovereign servant will prevail in the face of all opposition that would be thrown at him. He is worthy of your trust. He is worthy of your faith. He is worthy for you to commit all that you are to him. He is worthy for you to commit your life to him, for you to commit your soul to him. He is worthy because He is an impeccable Savior who will never falter nor fail. Whose side are you on? We were all born into this world in sin and in darkness. And there must come a time and a point in every one of our lives where we change sides, where we cross over. And that requires that we turn our backs to sin and we repent of our sin and turn away from all the allurements of sin and turn exclusively to this servant who came to seek and to save that which is lost and to entrust your life to Him. And him who comes unto me, I will in no wise cast out. I have never met anyone in my entire life, and I never will, who has regretted that they gave their life to Jesus Christ. Because he is a perfect servant and he is a perfect Savior. And if you will entrust your life to him, he will lead you from victory unto victory unto victory. And we have the record of it here in these verses. I call upon you to give your life to Christ. It's not enough for you to hear this gospel message. You must, as an act of your will, choose to believe upon Jesus Christ. If the greatest temptation took place in the temple, in the temple at the pinnacle of the temple, It's not enough just to be in the house of the Lord where the truth is taught. You could have the best seat up on the top and go straight to hell. You must believe upon Jesus Christ. You must transfer the entirety of your trust to Him and by that deny yourself, renounce 
all that you have been to this point and give yourself completely to Christ in faith and you will receive from Him all of the victory that He will win at the cross. If you've never done that, may God lead you this day to trust in Him. Our Father, we thank You for this glorious Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank You that You did not send one of these ministering angels to die upon the cross for us. We thank You that You did not send one of the prophets nor the lawgiver Moses. We thank You that You did not send even the best of men, such as Job or John the Baptist, but that in Your love and wisdom You have sent to us Your only begotten Son. You have sent to us this perfect, unwavering, resilient servant who has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Father, thank You for the perfection of His death on our behalf. And may we rise up and come to Him in Jesus' name. Amen. The following has been an audio recording of Christ Fellowship Baptist Church and is under the direct copyright of Christ Fellowship Baptist Church. All recordings may be used freely for the ministry and application of the Word of God. However, written permission must be obtained from Christ Fellowship Baptist Church before any recording is broadcast or redistributed in any form. In no way should this recording be disseminated without the express consent of Christ Fellowship Baptist Church.